Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be here in, uh, in England, in London, and specifically here in the uh, Marx Memorial uh, Library, and to meet some friends that I haven't seen for so many years, like uh, David, my dear friend, that last time we met, I think it was about 10 years ago, and uh, Salam Ali that we, we met lately in Portugal, we just discovered it was something like six years ago, seven years ago, I guess. And to know a few uh, new uh, friends, I made a very dear new friend, it's Hak Cohen who is here. Was, uh, I'm very grateful for he and his family hospitality, and I stay with them. So I'm really uh, very well appreciated. Thank you so very much. And all of you, of course. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know for those who don't follow my uh, uh, Facebook or Twitter, because sometimes I do publish in English as well. Normally only in Arabic and Hebrew, but sometimes in English, especially if I if I see that something is uh, very important internationally. So I, tr I, uh, I try to also to write in English. So for those who do not follow or don't follow me, it's not that I expect anyone to follow me. It's not that interesting, you know, hardly my wife does. So, but uh, <clears throat> anyway, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm well known for my big mouth, <laughs> especially especially in the Israeli society at large and in the Knesset as well. I, I just discovered yesterday, by the way, that the ethics committee of the Knesset is supposed to charge me for calling a, a, another member of the Knesset a, 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 a disgusting a Nazi. So, uh, and it's forbidden to use the term in the, in the Israeli parliament. So you cannot call Nazis Nazis in Israel, you see? <laughs> and uh, so I'm saying that because uh, I am going to use my big mouth here and I hope that nobody is going to be insulted. Uh, and if someone does, so it's his or her problem. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I uh, just began with this introduction because I, uh, and you discover in less than a second what I meant, why I did find uh, it suitable to uh, introduce it in such a way, is because the current government of Israel is for the first time a full-fledged fascist government with neo-Nazi components. Full stop. That's the beginning of my speech it's important for me that people will be aware of that. It's very common to refer, for instance, to uh, the Italian new government as a fascist or neo-fascist government. It's common to call Viktor Orban fascist. And of course it's true. Or even uh, Modi in India or Bolsonaro, uh, that luckily is not a president anymore. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there's a wave of fascism across the globe, so I won't refer to each and every prime minister or president in the world now, and unfortunately there are too many fascists. And, uh, and it's even uh, acceptable to refer, for instance, to the Golden Dawn in Greece as neo-Nazis, or to the uh, new uh, 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 powered uh, uh, party in Sweden as neo-Nazi. But in Israel, you cannot, it's very unacceptable to call someone a fascist, let alone a neo-Nazi. Even everybody can assume why. Because of the history, because of the, the immediate intuition that comes to the fore once you refer to someone as a Nazi or a neo-Nazi. But I want to emphasize, and I hope that that goes to the Israeli uh, medias. Normally it does, you know, and I'm happy about it. Because people must understand the danger that is in front of us. The Israeli government is a full-fledged fascist government with neo-Nazi components. Names that may, perhaps you heard of, like Ben Gvir, Smutrich, and even some members from the Likud party, Netanyahu's party, hold neo-Nazi perceptions and beliefs. And the truth should be said. We cannot sugarcoat the truth. We should use the new, the, the right terms. Now, I want to, to, to explain what's ahead of us. Why I refer to those thugs in such names or descriptions, to be more precise. First of all, 
I want to share with you what just came to my knowledge today or yesterday in the last 24 hours by, you know, reading newspapers and getting some messages from uh, colleagues and uh, from my staff at the Knesset. <clears throat> Let's begin with one thing that happened today. Today there was Jewish, you call them extremists, I will call them fascists or Nazis, whatever, and a demonstration in the occupied East Jerusalem, just in front of in front of Bab el Amud, which is uh, in the old city, an entrance, a gate, one of the gates to enter the old city, the occupied old city. There was a demonstration by some Jewish thugs. One of them is a senior representative in the Jerusalem, Jerusalem municipality. And in their demonstration, that by the way was allowed by the occupying police forces, preventing Palestinians from getting there. This is a Palestinian area, you should understand. <clears throat> they were prevented from entering their own lands and places in order to allow those thugs to demonstrate. And what did they say in this demonstration? It was sent to me by video just a couple of hours, not a couple of, five hours ago, something like that. <laughs> they shouted, we want Nakba now. This is the bon ton in Israel now. Thought in Israel now. Obviously, they were now, neither of them was arrested. <laughs> they were allowed. By the way, if an Arab, a Palestinian, would shout something similar to that, if he, was, if he would have been lucky, he would be arrested. And you know what would happen if he wasn't lucky. But Jews allowed to shout whatever they like. And of course, Nakba now means uh, extermination, deportation, destruction. By the way, as someone, uh, allow me to say, as someone that used to teach in the past in the university logics, they also would fail the course. Mm -hmm. Because those who say we want a second Nakba, at the same time they say that there wasn't the first one. <laughs> so, but that's just a, something I remember throughout the, the, the discussion. So, but this is only one example. Let's take other examples. What's going on now at the Knesset itself? And then I go back to what's going on to so-called in the streets, among the public. But at the Knesset itself, first and foremost, let's remember that out of 120 members of the Knesset, we are only five. We are the only ones, plus only one from the Labour Party, which is an exceptional. So altogether, our <clears throat> fraction of the Knesset, five seats, plus one from the Labour, we are the only six who actually uh, use the term occupation apart in apartheid. Nobody even refers to it. In the past, some people said occupation, but we want it. No, it's not even allowed to use the term occupation. Sooner or later, I'm sure, it's going to be delegalized. Let alone apartheid or ethnic cleansing. And those exist in the Palestinian occupied territories and within the 48 borders within the state of Israel proper as well. There is a system of apartheid according to the a, a, a common definition of the United Nations and the Roma Convention, for those who know it. Israel answers or fits the definitions of the Roma Convention and the United Nations to apartheid. In so many areas in the occupied Palestinian territories, there, uh, there is ethnic cleansing. In the south hills of Hebron, of El Khalil, there is an area called Mesafer Yata. More than 1,000 Palestinians live there so many years and it was declared just lately the supreme court which for one reason or another has the image of a liberal one which is nonsense they decided that it is legal to uh, uh, deport those people from their lands in order to allow the israeli occupying military to pursue some 
exercises there. By the way, they don't. It's just an excuse for the ethnic cleansing there. In East Jerusalem, there's an ethnic cleansing by assaulting and molesting the Palestinian to the degree they would that they would leave because they cannot uh, they cannot tolerate it anymore. Cleansing too, by the way, by the definition again by the United Nations and the international law, by them the definition of ethnic cleansing is not just pointing a gun at someone and, and in order to deport him or her, but also to make the life of someone so miserable that one has to flee. That's also ethnic cleansing. Israel has been pursuing ethnic cleansing for ages, but it became more and more severe in the last few years. And nowadays even more, more so. So, but it's not only the occupation and the apartheid and ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. And that's one of the main differences between the current government and the former ones, because we know that the occupation, the regime, the, the military rule over the Palestinians uh, in the uh, West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the siege, the malicious, deadly, uh, sadistic siege over Gaza Strip, those exist for many years, you know. It's not new. <laughs> Something else has changed, and I give you a few examples. The first law that the new government passed just lately, two, year, two weeks ago, something like that, transforms the power over the police from the chief of the police, who is supposedly is in a professional and not political per se, a figure, to the minister, the national security minister who is Ben Gvir. And Ben Gvir is one of, in my view, is the only second to Smutrich, if you know the name, in being a neo-Nazi thug. By the way, this Ben Gvir who always, you know, uh, incites against us, myself and my friends, as supporter of terrorists, as a, a Jewish hatred, a, a, as joint uh, haters, as a, as the enemies, a fifth column, whatever, and terrorists. <laughs> He's the only member of the Knesset that was actually convicted in supporting terrorism, Jewish terrorism. He was convicted. He was convicted by the courts in assaulting police officer. He was leading for many years. He lives as a settler near in, in El Khalil in the, as a pain in the neck of the Palestinians. And continuously he was leading assaults on Palestinians in El Shuada Street, in the market of El Khalil and other places. He is now the Minister of National Security and he's got in the, this coming week it's going to be even uh, strengthen. He's got the power over the police to the extent that he can decide, note, he can decide even what is going to be investigated and what not. He's going to have the power to decide, for instance, who is entitled to demonstrate and who is not. And that's only the tip of the iceberg. So that's the, one of the first laws that the government actually enacted. And you know, this, the, the, the system, the political system in Israel resembles to a great extent the one in England because it is a parliamentary system. So the government actually controls the legislator. You know, there's no real separation of powers as far as the legislator and the executive are concerned. So the government by in Israel it's a, it's a coalition system. In England, it used to be quite exceptional, although in the last two elections, I, I, I think it was also a coalition here. But uh, in Israel, it's always been like this, a coalition that has the majority seats in the Knesset itself, so they can actually do whatever they can. The only bulwark against the government, the only checks and balances that could prevent the government throughout the years from doing whatever the government likes 
well, you know, some formal checks and balances and informal. What do I mean by that? Formal is basically the state controller, for instance, or the state attorney, <laughs> the, and mainly the judicial system. There's a lot of criticism because I just, I, as I just indicated, the judicial system always has always supported the occupation. Never, you know, dictated something against the uh, military or the uh, secret police, whatever. But still, in some other respects, it, it was used. Let's say in that way to stop the government from uh, carrying out some crimes against the Palestinians and against the progressive powers within Israel, the progressive factors, let's say, within Israel, Jews and Palestinians and others. And I will refer to that because that's the next target. The independent judicial system is going to be eliminated in the next few weeks. That's the next endeavor of Netanyahu's government. To abolish the judicial system, I shall explain in a second how come. But also, there are informal, you know, checks and balances or limits. Free press, it's under attack as well. There's no real free press in Israel now. Not because the law doesn't allow freedom of press, but because the incitement and the violent against the media, especially against those who criticize Netanyahu in particular and the government in general, <clears throat> are on the rise all the time. Nowadays in Israel, journalists are afraid to open their mouth. So it's not only the legal hindrances or limitations, it's also the kind of discourse that this fascist government allows or encourages. So, so many journalists, as a generic term, journalists in the, in the, uh, the television or the radio or, or, or the, the printed uh, newspapers or even the, the social network, many of them are afraid to open their mouth because they are afraid they are going to be physically attacked. There are some examples of journalists who allowed themselves and insisted in talking against the government and against especially the occupation and racism, like you probably know Gidon Levy. He's a prominent one. He needed to uh, be uh, accompanied by a bodyguard. And some simply decided not to take the risk. This is a fascist culture, not just a fascist, fascist formal system. Same about, and by the way, some other journalists were actually put in, 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 a, in, a, in a, their position by Netanyahu and his companions. So you, you, there is a combination of dedicated or loyal journalist loyal to Netanyahu in person, or at least to the coalition. There's a combination between those and other journalists who are afraid, and I do not uh, put the blame on them. I can understand that. If one is <laughs> under a continuous threat, I cannot blame him for being afraid. He's not the, the guilty one. The thugs are the guilty ones. And again, this is only just, at, uh, as I said before, the tip of the iceberg now. So there's no real free press in Israel now. Again, not because the law doesn't allow it, although we are approaching a change in the law as well. The new minister appointed, surprisingly, surprisingly, yeah, by Netanyahu to be in charge of the media, is, uh, is all, he already declared that he's going to shut down the public channel. The public channel is, a, <coughs> a, a, is a, the leading one in criticizing 
the government or the common uh, or the, the public discourse or whatever, not very, not enough in my view, <coughs> but at least relatively in comparison to other channels, it does. So now they're going to shut it down. There's another change <laughs> that we just began to see in the education system. There are two ministers now that are in charge of the, of the, of the education. There is the education minister, and there's another minister that is going to be, is already not going to be, is in charge of the so-called external projects. That means uh, uh, projects that are, uh, 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 that, are go that are adopted uh, by the education system, but they are carried out by factors who are not or, uh, organically part of the education system, which is part of privatization as well, of course. So <laughs> they already declared, both ministers, about the radical changes they are going to insert into education system. For instance, they are going to abolish the project against racism. There is a project, by the way, not a very progressive one, a very problematic one, but at least there is a sense of mentioning something against racism. They're going to eliminate it from the curriculum. There's no going, there are, there, after many years, there's not going to be a project against racism at schools. Another thing is disallow, and they already mentioned that, they disallow to external factors that support human rights to enter and lecture at schools. For instance, Bezalem, you know Bezalem. Bezalem and other human rights organizations, especially those who a struggle for the for the rights of the Palestinians and for others like women, LGBT, they are going to be disallowed to enter schools. There's one thing they're going to strengthen, strengthen religious studies. Religious studies following the perspective, a very specific perspective which adopts Jewish supremacism. Those are changes that the new government already began to carry out. And now I want to say some things about, say a few words about the judicial uh, uh, system, because that's probably the most important uh, uh, and very topical uh, thing. Uh, <coughs> change a few things in the, that, as I mentioned before, practically that is going to eliminate totally the independence of the judicial system, not to say the judicial system as such. The first thing they're going to change is the committee that nominates judges. Since 1953, there's a committee consists of seven persons, which is more or less, less balanced between the executive, the attorney's chamber, the Supreme Court, and the parliament, the legislator, there is a kind of a balance between all those authorities in uh, nominating or uh, electing uh, judges. Now, and this week, it's going to be the beginning of the discussion in enacting the process of uh, uh, passing this law, this bill begins in two days time. They're going to change the committee, so the government is going to control the committee. The government. They're going to change it from seven persons committee to 11, out of which seven are going to be from the coalition or the government and supporters of the government. That means, before I even continue, and there's more, before I even continue, enough to understand that that's the final cut or the final nail in the coffin of the separation of, of authorities or powers in, in Israel. Because as I mentioned before, the government already controls the Knesset, already controls the parliament. The government already eliminated the free press, the, uh, uh, the uh, 
education system, etc. And I said what I said about the police, of course, there are many other things. I will mention another one in a second. But end of the judicial system. So it means that eventually, in a few weeks' time, or a few months at most, there's going to be even just one power in Israel, the executive, the government. No judicial, no, no ex a, a real independent legislator and no judicial. Because the judges who are going to be elected are going to be the ones who are totally loyal to the government. Now that's the first test of the judge elected, that they are going to be elected by, I said, the majority of, the, of this committee is, con consists of the supporters and members of the coalition and the government, but that's only the first test. After those judges are elected, there's going to be a hearing at the Constitution Committee of the Knesset, and guess who controls the Constitution Committee of the Knesset, which I'm a member of, by the way, as the majority in the Constitution Committee. So it means that after the first test, which already gives huge power to the government over and above the legislator and, of course, the, judicial, the independent judicial, the hearing is going to even give it more, more power. Because after the first test, the second test is going, you know, to select those who are better for the government and the prime minister. Now, after that, the judicial system, not only the Supreme Court, the, the all courts in Israel throughout the hierarchy is going to be in the hands of the government, of the prime minister personally, and the justice minister who is a not only a disciple, but he's the, the, uh, almost the twin brother of Netanyahu, of the Prime Minister. He follows what the Prime Minister wants. They act together. And on top of that, there are another two changes in the judicial, judicial system. They are going to eliminate, for instance, the possibility of the High Court to <coughs> sell a legally laws that were accepted by the Knesset under the explanation that they are anti-constitutional. There's no constitution in Israel, which is another problem, by the way, but they are so-called basic laws, very weak ones, but they apparently have the status of a material constitution as opposed to formal constitution. So since 1992, the first time the two basic laws that deal with human rights were accepted. Ever since, in the exactly 31 years ago, the court could cancel a, a laws that were enacted by the parliament if the judges realized that those laws contradict those basic laws, especially as far as human rights are concerned. That's going to be over because the law explicitly says judges cannot overrule laws enacted by the Knesset, but only if all judges that sit together accept uh, unanimously that the law should be uh, 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 overruled. The chances are very slim. <laughs> So, and there's another, there are some others I wouldn't like to exhaust you because it's too specified and we need much more time. But that's probably the most dangerous and important uh, uh, thing that's, that is going to happen very soon. Israel is moving now towards a full-fledged fascist dictatorship. And the international community, whatever that means, following our chat before, <laughs> uh, must, understand, must do something. We continue our struggle. We never give up. Our church has said we shall never surrender. Yeah? But uh, 
and we shall never surrender. It's not enough. If we do not, and remember my words, seriously, I don't want to sound dramatic, <clears throat> or actually I do, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but remember, if the international community, the, the governments around the world don't do something to stop this fascist, crazy, racist government, this fascist accompanied by neo-Nazi government, it's going to end up in a huge bloodshed that even Enoch Powell didn't predict when he was talking about rivers of blood. Because now if you want me to uh, borrow names from the history of Britain, Israel is controlled by a combination of Enoch Powell and, and uh, Oswald Mosley. That's Israel today, as far as the government is concerned. And of course, the first victim are the Palestinians in the occupied territories, but within the sovereign state of Israel too. And the writing is on the wall written by blood, not by ink. And it's going to be written with, with much more blood, especially Palestinian blood, if we don't stop them. And I, all, and I want the world to understand that. And I try to spread the word wherever I can. I said exactly the same when I was interviewed by CNN and Al Jazeera or any other channel or newspaper around the, the globe. Because Israel must be saved from itself. Of course, on top of saving the Palestinians who are the continuous victims for ages. And I'm, and I'm warning here, everybody who listens or watches us, I'm warning, I'm not a prophet, I'm not trying to be. It's just understanding, you know, political developments and evolutions. We are on the brink of a huge disaster. The first ones to pay the price are going to be the Palestinians, as I said before. They are going to be butchered if we don't stop the government. They are going to be butchered. In the West Bank is Jerusalem, Gaza Strip, and within Israel. I don't know if you remember what happened in May 2021, that once Israel attacked Gaza, following, by the way, who ignited the fire? The same Ben Gvir that now is the National Security Minister. He ignited the fire by penetrating to Al-Aqsa and to an uh, occupied old, uh, old city in Jeru East Jerusalem. And Israel once they attacked Gaza, there was a fire within some cities within Israel, cities in which Palestinians and Jews live side by side. Unfortunately, I cannot say really together. I wish it was together. But it, there's no togetherness under hierarchy. So I would say side by side. <clears throat> and Palestinians were attacked viciously by some neo-Nazi thugs. People were hurt, people were killed, Jews and Palestinians. <coughs> it's only, I'm afraid, that's going to be the, only the beginning. And in Israel wants that. I mean, the government of Israel wants that because they will, ex they will use it as an excuse to follow what I begin with, another Nakba. They want that. They said the writing is on the wall by blood, not by ink. And, but it's not only the Palestinians, the next ones who are going to pay the price are the democratic Jews within Israel, like myself. We are, we are already targeted. are attempts to kick us out of the Knesset, by the way, for instance. Let's begin with that. I personally am going to be charged probably, although it's not, uh, uh, it's not uh, sure yet, but there's a great chance that I'm going to be charged or prosecuted uh, 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 because 
as, I, as it were, I attacked a policeman, which is a hogwash. <laughs> but it's not me, it's not a personal issue. There's going to be, after Palestinians, and you probably remember the very famous poem by Martin Nimler. In German, you said in the beginning they took the communists, they didn't raise my voice, so therefore they took the uh, active, the, uh, the uh, trade unionists, etc., etc. Eventually, when they came to take me, nobody was left to raise one's voice. That's exactly what's going to happen. The Palestinians are going to be taken first. Nobody or hardly anybody is going to raise one's voice because they are Palestinians and nobody cares about them internationally as well. Communists will be, will be taken, the trade unionists, hardly, there are hardly any trade unionists in Israel, by, by the way, so probably that's not the best example, the liberals are going to be taken, okay? <clears throat> or those who oppose the occupation, even though they are not socialists, there are some. They are, they are, they are to be taken. Women are already, there are, there are only already some laws that are going to encourage a, a gender segregation in Israel. I didn't mention it before because there are so many things. And by the way, there's a blitz of laws. It's in a very short time. It's not, it doesn't even take time. They already plan to some of them, you know, in the government, there are those among those neo-Nazi thugs, there are many fundamentalists as well. The same minister I mentioned before that is in charge of the external projects in the education system, he explicitly says time after time that the role of women is to stay at home in the kitchen bringing child children. He's the minister in charge of the projects of in, in the education system. He does, I, 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 it's, it's, it's difficult to believe where we find ourselves. We are not on the brink of the, you know, of the abyss. We are deep in the abyss already. And there are so many things, you know, to add. Another law, by the way, that I forgot to mention is that they are going now to revoke a law that bars racist blocks in parliament. So, those things, we are in a very dangerous situation. And by the way, I began to say, so if the first they take the Palestinians and, and, and afterwards the progressive or liberal or whatever, anti-racial, anti racist, anti-occupation Jews, that Keno is going to erupt because obviously, first of all, Palestinian organizations are not going to be silent for a long time. They cannot be silent for a long time. They cannot allow their people to be persecuted, oppressed, humiliated, anything. It will end one day. And then everything is going to explode. And it, le it will lead to fire, to big fire in the region. That makes the Ukrainian-Russia issue perhaps even relatively small one, because we know the region. We know what's going on in the Middle East. We know the dangers. And that, by the way, one of the consequences is that it's going to, that's the reason to use Iran. The United States, Israel, and some others like Saudi Arabia, the so-called reactionary regimes, they use Iran as a scapegoat, by the way. It's not because I'm a supporter of Iran's regime, or of course not, far from that. But they want to use Iran as a scapegoat in order to unite them, to find a common parlance, common de denominator. That's another danger. So eventually the whole world is going to pay the price. So it's not only a matter, of course, first and foremost, it's a matter of justice, of uh, whatever, uh, uh, of justice or liberation, of equality, whatever, but it's also a matter of the world interests. So I would finish by, I think that my 30 minutes are already passed. So, no? Yeah, just about.
Perhaps I'll finish in five minutes, okay? Give me five, five minutes more. Where have I been talking? <laughs> so those who say that uh, when uh, you, you enjoy, so the time flies, all right. Uh, anyway, so it has nothing to do with the content, just with the company, uh, <laughs> to be precise. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, what I wanted to say before I begin to conclude is that the danger is very grave. Uh, two things uh, uh, that I must say before I finish. First, this government still is different from the former ones. Not uh, although all of the governments, all Israeli governments, supported the Jewish supremacism one way or another. The occupation has been there most of the years. You know, Israel exists for seventy-five years. The occupation is fifty-five years. You make the calculation. Is the occupation as Hague probably going to uh, uh, to declare sooner or later? The occupation is not a temporary issue. It is inherent to the Israeli political and social lives. So what's different? The difference has already stems from what I said is that it's not only that the persecution and the death toll and the torching and everything of the Palestinians is going to be worse. That's for sure. But there's one different, which is not only a quantitative change, but a qualitative change or essential change, is that thus far, at least those who are privileged, that means <coughs> Jews within Israel, especially uh, uh, Occidental Jews, we are, I must say, but we use some of us, not enough. We use, we use our privilege to protest and struggle against those uh, injustices. So, no, no presents, but we could use our privilege to protest and struggle against occupation, against racism, against, by the way, class exploitation, I didn't mention it, or gender exploitation. Now that is going to be over too, because once there's no free judiciary, once human rights, I didn't mention that, human rights organizations are, are targeted as well. But I mentioned Bezalem as far in, in, in regard to the school and the education system, but then some other laws that are going to be enacted uh, are going to limit the very possibility of human rights organization to act as a whole in general not only to enter schools, but in general. So once those are limited, even the privileged so-called won't be able to join forces with the victims in struggling for peace, justice, and liberation. That's a huge difference. So, uh, but still, and that's, that would be the last sentence, it's going to be a long sentence, but the last one. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> still believe that we can eventually win. By, two, by three things. First of all, that I mentioned before, by not giving up. And we won't give up, I assure you. Not myself, not my, co my comrades. We never continue our struggle. We continue our struggle with our Comrades, brothers and sisters, Palestinians, brothers and sisters. Another thing that I mentioned, we do need the international intervention and international intervention. That may be a product of a pressure from so-called from above, from the peoples. I don't trust any leader in the world that would do anything to stop that madness. But if there is a pressure from the peoples, the governments won't be able to refrain from acting. That's the second thing. And okay, that would suffice, I believe. Thank you.